Good uh, morning. I think we're still no. We're, good afternoon. We're we're in the afternoon now. Um, I am the next speaker. Let me introduce myself briefly. My name is Morris Gleason. I am a member of the International Society of Genetic Genealogy. Um, I helped organise these uh, DNA lectures here in the RDS for the last five years, and I run a variety of different um, surname projects. Um, the Gleason DNA project, the Farrell DNA project, the Malloy, the Maloney, the O'Malley, the Coldwell, so a whole variety of them. So I've been very, very heavily steeped in Y DNA for this last uh, couple of years. And what I'm going to talk to you about uh, today is what do your Y DNA results actually mean? Now, how many people here have actually done a Y DNA test? So quite, quite a few, about uh, 30 people there in the audience have done a Y DNA test. And um, you'll probably know that Y DNA is only inherited by, from, the, from father to son. So it's along the father, father, father line. Um, I will have inherited it from my father, he from his father, he from his father, and so on. So that Y chromosome is only passed down to us from our father. And only men get that Y chromosome. Women do not get the Y chromosome, they get the X chromosome instead. So only men get the Y chromosome, and of course it determines our gender. It uh, makes us uh, men. So it's very, very useful because the path of the Y chromosome, the father, father, father line, also follows the same path as the surname. So it's actually very, very useful for surname research. And that's why a lot of uh, the uh, projects that you find on family tree DNA are Y DNA surname projects. The other good thing about Y DNA is it can help us um, uh, connect with close cousins on our father, father, father line. So you've got a uh, father, father going up on one side, a father, father, father going up on the other side, and it meets at a common ancestor sometime back in the past. And the other thing that Y DNA informs us about is our deep ancestry. Uh, where we migrated from once we came out of Africa, moved into Europe, and then spread across to the rest of the world. So those are the three things that you can get from a Y-DNA test. And these are your Y-DNA results. This is the Y-DNA results page. And um, it has the account information here. Uh, you can look at your order history on this one here. Um, there's my name up at the top. It has my Hapler group here, and a variety of different tabs that you can uh, click on and get some further information. And to start off with, well, there also is a list of projects. So you can join any number of projects that you want to, and you can see that I have joined about 20 different projects with my YDNA results. You don't have to limit yourself to um, one or two projects, and you can actually join as many as you want to. But if you actually click on the tab that says YSTR results, then this is what you get. You get panel one, panel two, <coughs> panel three, the name of the marker here at the top, and then the value for that marker underneath. But what does that actually mean? And to understand the answer to that question, we really have to take a closer look at the Y chromosome itself. And the Y chromosome, like every chromosome, is composed of a short arm and a long arm, and there's a little nip there in the middle, and all along the length of the chromosome, we have these genes. And of course, the Y chromosome is going to have genes that are typical of men, such as the inability to see or hear the obvious. <laughs> um, the got one gene, ability to remember and tell jokes. Uh, one of my favorite is the DC-10, the ability to identify aircraft. And um, another one down here, which I thought is very, very uh, uh, appropriate, the oops gene, the lack of recall for dates, especially your anniversary and your wife's birthday. So these are the typical uh, genes that you're going to get on the Y chromosome, tongue in cheek, of course. But it illustrates the point that along the length of our chromosomes, we have these genes that code for characteristics that make you, you. Whether you've got blue eyes or brown hair, or whether you're tall or short, whether you have a preponderance uh, of a certain, uh, you might have a propensity for certain diseases. That's all coded for by these genes that are dotted along the length of your chromosomes. 
but also along the length of the chromosomes, you'll get a variety of different DNA markers that are useful from the point of view of ancestry. And those are the ones that we really want to look at when we're looking at uh, either Y-DNA for connecting us with same surname cousins, or autosomal DNA, which is all the other chromosomes, for connecting us with cousins on any of our ancestral lines. Now, if we take this Y chromosome and we unravel it, then as it unravels, you begin to see this double helix structure that was made famous uh, by Watson and Crick back in 1953 when they discovered the structure of DNA. And if you unwind that even further, you're ending up with two strands of DNA that make up this double helix. And along each strand, you have a series of letters. And these letters are the bases, are the nucleotide bases, G, C, A, and T. Guanine, cytosine, adenine, and thymine. But we just go by the first letter, G, C, A, T. The G and the C always binds with each other. They always bind with each other. Um, so that you can remember it by looking at the curved letters bind with another curved letter. You never get a curved letter binding with a straight-edged letter. And then the A and the T, they always bind with each other. It might be AT or TA. It can bind, bind either way. And if you actually look at um, this strand here, it will be a mirror image of the strand above it. And out of this, we get two types of DNA marker. The first one is the STR marker, also called the short tandem repeat. And the key word here is repeat, because if you look at those, those letters, TAC, 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 those letters are repeated three times. So the value, the value for this particular marker would be three, because those, the, that sequence of, of letters is repeated three times. And that's what the number means when you get your Y-DNA results. It's the number of times a certain sequence of letters is repeated. Now, the other type of DNA marker is called the SNP, or single nucleotide polymorphism, and the key word here is substitution. Whereas with the STORs, you're looking at a sequence of letters. With a SNP, you're just looking at one. And that one letter might have been a T in the previous generation, but a mistake happens, a mutation happens, and that T is replaced by an A, or it's replaced by a G, or it's replaced by a C. And then that new letter will be passed on to subsequent generations thereafter. So a SNP is simply just a substitution of a single letter. So those are the two types of DNA marker. And of course, arising out of that, we have two different types of DNA tests. You can have STR marker tests, and you can test 37 markers, 67 markers, or 111 markers. Or you can have SNP tests. And SNP marker tests can either be a single SNP test, so you can just test a single marker, or it can be a SNP pack, which is about 100, 120, 140 of these markers in a pack. And you can use, uh, use that pack to test about 120 of them. And then the creme de la creme, the big Y test, tests in excess of 50,000 SNP markers. So it's a huge order of magnitude greater than the SNP packs or the single SNP tests. Um, and that is an expensive test. That is normally about $575. It goes down to $395 in the sale. But it will give you a huge amount of information about the DNA markers on your Y chromosome. So the two types of STO marker, uh, two types of DNA marker, and now the two types of DNA test as a result. But of course, these markers go undergo these mutations from time to time. So we talked about how a SNP might have been an A, one generation, but then as that parent, as that father, is making a copy of his DNA and passing it on to the son, a mistake gets made in the copying process. So for example, here we have early man in East Africa, finger on the photocopier. He has six sons, and you might notice a strange anomaly arising in son, son number four. There's been a mistake in the copying process, and he ends up with a big blue nose. Son number five, there's another mistake in the copying process, and he, he's called tiny by his brothers. 
So, and it's these mutations that occur during the copying process when the parent is producing the sperm cell that contains all the uh, half of the chromosomes that get passed on, including the Y chromosome, that's where these mutations arise. And all the children of son number four are going to have blue noses. And all the children of son number five are going to be relatively tiny. So that's how mutations arise, and that's how mutations get passed on. And of course, if we look at it in terms of a, an STOR marker, and let's look at the STOR marker DYS458, it has a value of 17 in the father, but that maybe increases to a value of 18 in the son, and in son number 5 it might decrease to a value of 16. So that's how the numbers on the STOR markers can go up and down. And here's a, a, a very interesting slide that gives you the name of a couple of these STOR markers, um, the type of repeat that they have, and then the kind of motif or letters that you see uh, for each of these markers, and then the average number of repeats. Let's look at DIS458, DYS458. This type of repeat is tetra, meaning four, and it's G-A-A-A. -A -A. I tried to pick one that's kind of Irish sounding. <coughs> so the G-A-A-A -A -A is this particular STR marker here, and it's repeated N number of times, N being on average about 17. So you're going to get 17 versions of G-A-A-A, G-A-A-A, G-A-A, with this particular marker. Now, of course, 17 is the average, and around the average, what are you going to get? You're going to get a range. Let's look at the range. There's the average there, 17, and you can see 32% of people in, this, in, this, in the population actually have a value of 17 for this marker, but 24% of a value of 16, 17% um, of a value of 15, 15% uh, of a value of 18, and so on, and it gets less and less as you go out on either side of the range. But it's just to make the point that some people will be 17, some people will be 18, some people will be 16, and some, some very rare people, 0.003% will be 23, and some very, very rare people will be 10. So in the general population, you get a range of values around the average that you see. And that really explains what you're seeing when you look at these STO results and looking at these numbers associated with each marker. Now the other thing that, you, that I want to talk about when you look at your results is this box here. And it says here the Y-DNA haplogroup, and it's M269. So what is a haplogroup? What does that actually mean? Well, it says your predicted haplogroup is RM269, and it's on the haplo tree. These are two terms. Uh, a haplo group means roughly a, a group of people that share basically the same genetic signature. So as early man left Africa, and let's say each of these six sons went in different directions, one son and his descendants went to Asia, another son and his descendants went to Australia, those were the Blue Nose Brigade, um, another son and his descendants went to Europe, and Tiny and his descendants went off to the Americas. So you can see that as mutations develop and people spread out across the globe, different haplogroups emerged. Groups of people with slightly different genetic variations. And as detectives, we can follow these um, uh, mutations and migrations across the world and together with linguistic data and archaeological data, we can actually track human migration out of Africa to all the four corners of the world. And here is an example of the type of migrations that you see. It starts here with genetic Adam in Africa, and there is, of course, some genetic variation occurring in Africa because that's where we stayed for 200,000 years which means that there's 200 times more genetic diversity within Africa than there is outside of Africa. Somebody from China and myself will have more in common genetically than somebody from North Africa and somebody from South Africa. It's incredible the amount of human diversity you see. But then, of course, 50,000 years ago, 
the last successful migration out of Africa occurred, and now we get human beings going all the way across the planet and settling in different geographical locations, bringing with them their own set of unique mutations that allow them to be characterized as in a certain haplogroup. So for example, in, in Western Europe, we're largely haplogroup R1B. But if you went over to China, you'd largely be haplogroup O. And if you went to the tip of South America, you would be haplogroup Q1A3A. And it's just to make the point that as we spread out and populated the planet, we developed mutations that now characterize people in different geographical locations. And here's the kind of um, distribution you get for R1B in Western Europe. And you can see that it's really highly concentrated in Western Europe. It's actually particularly concentrated in Ireland. I1 is another half of the group. It's particularly concentrated around Scandinavia. Is anybody I1? Does anybody? Yeah, a few people are I1. Well, Christina, I'm not surprised because you are from Scandinavia. But um, other people, well, if you've got an I1 uh, haplogroup, group, it may very well be that you have Viking ancestry on your father, father, father line. If you look at the groups in Africa, you have A2 and A3, your Khoisan, E1B1A, that is actually Bantu, and it's all across Africa. So different haplogroups groups concentrated in different geographical locations. And of course, as well as that, we're able to put these groups on the tree of mankind and build a human evolutionary tree that traces the evolution of humans from genetic Adam 250 years ago in Africa up to the present day. And when we first started this a mapping of the evolutionary tree back in 2002, on our particular branch in Western Europe, which is branch R, and there's a lot of other branches in various parts of the world, but on branch R, which is a Western European branch, we only had 16 sub-branches below that. That was in 2002. But this is such a young science that over the course of the years, we're discovering new markers and new markers all the time, so that in 2017, there are well over a thousand branches on haplogroup R, just this one branch of the human tree that is Western European. And some of those branches, it's very interesting what's happening. Each branch can be dated, so we get an idea of when that branching occurred and when people moved in to a particular geographical location. But the other thing that we're learning is that whereas this human migration kind of starts with Adam at the very top and moves down, whereas as genealogists, what do we do? We start with ourselves and we move up. What is happening now is this upstream down approach is actually beginning to meet this downstream up approach. And certainly with my Gleason family tree, I have brought the human evolutionary tree right down into the Gleason surname. And I've actually been able to look at the evolution of the surname within the last 1,000 years. So we've come from 250,000 years ago in Africa down to the last 1,000 years of your surname. And that's absolutely incredible. The other fascinating thing that's happening, and uh, this will be very uh, important implications for looking at the ancient annals, whether they're Scottish or Irish, is the fact that certain DNA markers, downstream DNA markers, are, are associated with certain surnames. And what we're finding is that a lot of those surnames are actually tying us in to the ancient annals, the ancient genealogies to do with the O'Briens or the O'Neills. Uh, or a lot of the old Irish sets. We're actually beginning at a stage now where we are beginning to prove that a lot of the Irish uh, annals are actually correct and the ancient genealogies are correct. So that is ongoing work and I'll give you some examples of that later on. So that really explains what your haplogroup is all about. It places you perhaps in a particular geographical area, number one, but it also places you on the tree of mankind. Now, we're talking about Y-DNA in this lecture. Of course, you can do the same thing with mitochondrial DNA and place yourself on the tree of womankind and look at the human evolutionary tree from that direct female line perspective. Now, another thing, so just to summarize the story so far, 
the two types of DNA marker. You have the SDR marker and the SNP marker, and the tests available for those two. Then you have uh, mutations giving rise to haplogroups, haplotree, and the uh, human migration pathways. Next, we're going to look at DNA matches. And these would be genetic cousins with whom you share an ancestor probably sometime in the last 1,000 years, which is a little bit further back than most of us have gone with our own genealogies. Uh, but I'll tell you another story about that tomorrow if you come to my next lecture. Um, and to look at your DNA matches, you click on this particular tab here, and this is the type of results that you get. Now, yeah, this is at the 67 marker level. I'll just read this out because it's not going to be visible from the back. I have eight matches on my 67 marker test. Um, this here is the genetic distance, 236777. <coughs> These are the names of the matches, and I'll call them out Glittle, Gleason, McLaughlin, Gleason, 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 McLaughlin. And there's a variety of um, icons here. We'll talk a little bit about them. And then the most distant known ancestor for each of these matches, and then the actual um, SNP marker that characterizes the, as far as they've tested on their SNP testing. And sometimes it's very high up in the family tree, sometimes it's quite far down. It depends whether they've done any additional SNP testing. But there's a few things here that I want to draw your attention to. And the first thing is genetic distance. And this is really just a measure of how closely you are related to somebody else. So for example, a genetic distance of two out of 67 means that there is a two-step difference away from an exact match. An exact match would have a genetic distance of zero. So an exact match is zero. Genetic distance of two, to me that suggests there's probably a common ancestor sometime in the last maybe 200 to 300 to 400 years, a genetic distance of seven suggests it's much further back than that, because you're much more far away from this person. Maybe it's a common ancestor in the 1500s or the 1400s. So that's the genetic distance. The other thing that's really, really important is the birth location of your most distant known ancestor, your earliest known ancestor. And this is an example of it here. And you can see that this particular chap here, Thomas Gleason, I've made it big up here, he comes from Boga Latin in Kilimac Hill, which is in Tipperary. And that's really, really useful information, especially if you're a member of the Irish diaspora. How many people from America here? Well, there's quite a few. There's about 10 people here from America. How many of you have information that says that your ancestor came from Ireland? There you go. Where in Ireland did he come from? It's difficult to know, but Y-DNA can actually help pinpoint where that elusive ancestor came from, and I'll show you an example of that. The thresholds for inclusion on your matches list are as follows, because not everybody gets put on your matches list. Those, those matches that are relatively close make it to your matches list. You know, and um, this is the threshold. At the 12 marker level, it's one, at 25, it's up to a genetic distance of two. At 37 markers, it's up to a genetic distance of four. And at 67, it's up to a genetic distance of seven. And at 111, it's up to a genetic distance of 10. So anything less than 10, they'll make your match list. Anything greater than 10, they won't. So there will be people out there in the database where you're, they've just been outside the threshold they won't actually appear on your matches list. And that's why when you join a surname project, you might be confused by, well, how come some of these people are on my match list, but a lot of these people that I'm grouped with, they don't actually appear on my match list at all. It's because they've fallen outside of this threshold. So that's the first thing to, to notice about genetic distance. And it's roughly about 10%. If you've tested the 37 markers, the cutoff is 10% of that, which is about 3.7, rounds up to 4. So that's how I remember it, roughly about 10%. So people who fall outside the threshold do not make it onto your matches list. So that explains why I only have the 8 matches at the 67 marker level. Now I've upgraded my results to 111 markers, and at 111 markers I only have 2 matches. One of them is a genetic distance of 6, the other is a genetic distance of 9. 
Um, one of the very interesting things that you can do, and it's one thing that you want to know as a genealogist is, okay, if I match this person, and the ge genetic distance is 9 out of 111, how far back is the common ancestor? Where do we actually connect? And here we have a real problem, because the answer is not very exact. But you can estimate it using the time predictor, the time to the most recent common ancestor between you and somebody else. If you click on that orange icon, this sort of thing comes up, and you get a comparison chart. It, it does it by every four generations. I like to tick, click on this and click every, every generation instead. So instead of looking at every four generations, 4, 8, 12, 16, I actually get this kind of a result here, which shows me what is the likelihood that these two people, uh, Miss, Mr. Little and Mr. Gleason, share a common ancestor within the last one generation, two generation, three, and so on. So when you get up to 19 generations, there's a 99% chance that we share a common ancestor sometime within the last 99, uh, 90, 19 generations. Well, that isn't great for me because I just I want to kind of I want to know when was my great 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 grandfather born, and I want to have a range of maybe 10 or 20 years uh, on either side of the estimate. So what I do is I manipulate manipulate this data a little bit by looking at the midpoint estimate or whatever is closest to it. And there's 45, that's 57. I'm going to look at the, the midpoint 50% mark, and that's about eight generations. Now, if you allow 30 years per generation, that's about 240 years ago from my date of birth, assuming that I'm around about 60. I'm kind of going over. I'm much younger than that. But assuming that I was about 60, that would give me about 300 years from the present day. That would take me back to about 1717, round it down to about 1700. We come to the conclusion that the common ancestor was born around about 1700. But of course, around every, around every estimate, there is a range. And here's the problem with the range. If we look for a 90% range, and that means taking the 5% level up here, which is about four generations, and let's look for the 95, 95, that's it there, which is about 15 generations, it means that the range that we calculate is about 1500 to 1850. Now, if it was 1850, I'm thinking, great, because I can look at records, I might find something in the records that are still available. But if it's 1500, what hope do I have of getting that far back? Very, very little indeed. So, at the end of all that, I can say there's a 90% chance that he was born between 1500 and 1850, and my best guess is somewhere around 1700. But, that's 1700 plus or minus 150 years. And while it is accurate, it is not exact enough for my genealogical needs. And the problem is that that's always going to be the way. We are never going to get anything more accurate than a, a, a best guess, plus or minus 150 years. You know, even if you go up to 500 STOR markers, it will narrow the range, but it's from a genealogical point of view, it might bring it down to plus or minus 100 years, or plus or minus 50 years, which is not great from a genealogical point of view. So that's the time predictor. It's actually, it's like a statistician says this is accurate, a genealogist will say it's sure, but it's not exact enough for my needs. The other thing that, that you should be aware of on your results page is the email icon. And if you click on the email icon, you can actually contact your match directly by email. You can compare your family trees, you can collaborate with each other, and hopefully you can break through brick walls in your family tree. And that is something that I have been able to do on my Spiran line. On my Gleason line, I have not been able to do that yet, even though I do match a lot of people in the Gleason group. But uh, it is possible to actually make a connection with somebody who holds the answer to breaking through your brick wall. Now, the other thing, that's matches. The next thing I want to turn to is projects. And there are a variety of different projects available there are surname projects, haplogroup projects, geographic projects, and special projects. 
And there's around about 9,700 surname projects of Family Tree DNA. And Family Tree DNA are the only company that supply Y DNA testing that is suitable for doing surname research. So if you do want to do surname research, and it doesn't just have to be your surname, it could be any surname in your family tree, you need to go to Family Tree DNA. Now, if you want to research a surname that's in the middle of your family tree, you're going to have to find a cousin that actually has that surname and get him tested as your proxy. But it is possible to search and uh, research any surname within your family tree. The thing that we do in surname projects is we group close genetic matches together and we analyze the resulting groups. So, to start off with, and this gives you an overview of what actually happens. This is the Gleason DNA project. The main point I want to make about this is, aren't the colors pretty? And the reason why I'm talking and directing you towards the pretty colors is because they make a pattern. And this pattern is the genetic signature of this particular group. So we've got several groups in the Gleason project. The first group has a very distinctive pattern. The second group down here has another group distinctive pattern that is different from those in group one. If I show you group three as well, they've got another very distinctive genetic pattern compared to the other two groups. So we're grouping people together on the basis that they broadly share the same genetic signature. And then when you look at the pedigrees of the people who have joined the project and the most distant known ancestors, everybody in lineage 2 and group 2 goes back to North Tipperary. Everybody in group 3 goes back to West Clare. Everybody in group 1 goes back to Suffolk in England. But not only that, they go back to uh, the same named individuals. This is Thomas Gleason, born in 1609. So if you are diaspora Irish, or if you're Irish American, or you think you're Irish American, and you think you're Gleason, you know, you've got your, your name is Gleason, if you did the DNA test, if you matched people in group two, that's telling you your family came from North Tipperary, that's where you focus your <coughs> research. So the DNA points you to a particular area where you can focus your research. And that's really helpful if all you knew beforehand was that your ancestor came from Ireland. If you match group three, you focus your research in West Clare. If you match group one, you're not Irish, you're English. Jackie Gleason belonged to that group. The Honeymooners, Sheriff Buford, T. Justice, Smoking the Bandit. Jackie Gleason belongs to group one. He used to hang around Irish bars in the Bronx all the time, and um, he didn't tell anybody that he was English. So it's interesting that what it can tell you. Another chap who was convinced he was English, uh, joined the project, did the test, he matches everybody in North Tipperary. He changed his password to kiss me, I'm Irish. So, you know, it can be life-changing when you get these results back. Now we do have another group up here, um, again it's a US group, and they've got NPEs, and we talk about NPEs in a while, and then there's another group here of ungrouped people, so it hasn't been possible to group them because they don't match any of the other groups in the project. So this raises several questions, but it also um, allows us to draw certain conclusions about the power of Y-DNA. First of all, it can help group people together into similar genetic groups. Those genetic groups can actually help identify a person's origin, and can also help identify a person's ancestry. Now, three questions. Why are some people ungrouped? What is an MPE and why is it relevant? And how are people grouped together? So why are some people ungrouped? Well, it could be because of an NPE, a surname or DNA switch, such as adoption or illegitimacy. Or it could be that um, they're from a rare branch of the family. A rare branch, there's not many surviving uh, members left, and only one person from that branch has tested so far, and that person will be sitting in the on group section until somebody else from this rare branch of the family actually tests. So if you are in an on group part of the surname project, it's a waiting game in the hope that somebody else will come along who also belongs to the same rare branch of your family that you do. 
do you have an NPE on your father's, father's, father's line? NPE, non-paternal event, surname or DNA switch, a break in transmission. Now, in Ireland, a lot of people will remember the test card, where you'd be in the middle of your favorite program with Dallas, and JR was just about to get shot, and then this would come up and you go, we're terribly sorry for the break in transmission, and normal services will be resumed as um, soon as possible. Um, well, it's similar with uh, adoptions, illegitimacies, infidelities within marriage. There is a break in transmission of the DNA. Unfortunately, normal services will not be resumed, um, but it will cause consequences down the line. And I refer to these as surname or DNA switches, because that's what they are. And so, for example, uh, say the father absconds, and the children, out of respect of the mother, take on the mother's name rather than the father that ran away and abandoned the family. That mother's name will now be associated with the father's Y-DNA, but the surname will be passed down with the, the, a different Y-DNA. And that's how you can get a switch in, uh, that causes a disconnect between the Y-DNA and the surname. Uh, and examples of that would be people taking their mother's name, but also people swearing allegiance to the, to the lord of the clan. Another example is when you get something that my dad refers to as the interloper. And the interloper might be the postman who always rings twice, and he might be... Um, he might be invading the family when the, the husband is away at work, and that interloper DNA comes in, but it gets associated with the surname of the husband. So this is where you get a DNA switch, and that DNA is passed down with the original surname through generations of further descendants. And again, there's a disconnect between the Y DNA and the surname. You get it with adoption, you get it with infidelity. So these are also called non-paternity events, or non-paternal events, or not the parents expected. And there are many different causes. I made mention to allegiance to the Lord of the Tour. And in ancient Ireland, back before the, the 1600s, this would have been quite a common thing to do. That you would show allegiance to the, the dominant family in the neighborhood by adopting that family's name. So then you might become O'Brien by DNA, of O'Brien by name, but Leeson by DNA. Um, and this would have been done with servants, with vassals, with uh, soldiers, tenants, and slaves. Adoption, fostering, and guardianship, very, very big in ancient Gaelic society. A young widow remarries. Her youngest children are six months old, one year old, two years old. What do the children do? They adopt the surname of the new husband. And that's another way that you can get this switch between the surname, uh, uh, between surnames. Sometimes it's a legal condition of marriage or inheritance. You will not marry my daughter unless you change your name so that our name gets carried down through generations. Taking a wife's name upon marriage, Oliver Cromwell was never Oliver Cromwell. He was Oliver Williams. But his wife was descended from Thomas Cromwell, who was one of the uh, major um, uh, assistants of Henry VIII. So, she had higher social status, and that's why he took her name. Now, there are two very interesting customs that were present in Gaelic Ireland that I still have not got my head around. One was customary coupling with powerful people. You know, the O'Brien is coming down to dinner on Saturday, darling. I'm going to leave you with him for an hour or so, and um, good luck with that. And associated with that was um, a, 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 a habit or a custom of naming uh, on the child on the, on the wife's deathbed. And I believe Turlough O'Brien was one of these named children where the, the wife would call the, the husband in and say, darling, I'm off now. I just needed to, to say a few things to you. Do you know our, remember, you know our oldest child? She said, of course I do. Sure, I'm and I, his father. Ah, well, that's what I wanted to talk to you about. Uh, so it was very, very strange custom that they had back then, and um, uh, I still haven't got my head around it. Infidelity was a was not the way we think about it under Brehan law, and illegitimacy as well, totally different concept under Brehan law. But all of these things can um, mean that you get a surname or DNA switch, and there's lots of different causes. And how frequently do they occur? 
about 1 to 2 percent every single generation. How many generations since your surname came into being? About 30. It's about 900 to 1,000 years. So that's 30 generations, 1 to 2 percent per generation. That's 30 to 60 percent chance that your surname does not go back to the person who originated it 900 or 1,000 years ago. And you can round that up to about 50. So we, all of us have a 50-50 chance that our surname does not go back to the person that originated it. So how are people grouped together? This is the second question that arises from, uh, from these surname projects. And there's a variety of different markers of potential relatedness that we use. Um, genetic distance, well the same surname is the first one. It's people with the same surname. It's like, oh, you have the same, so maybe you're related to each other. That's the first marker of potential relatedness. We'll also be looking at genetic distance, um, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Uh, we'll also be looking at um, rare marker values. You saw that some of those SDR values were only shared by 0.003% of the population. If you get two people with the same surname and the same rare marker value, they're probably related. Marker of potential relatedness. And then, of course, SNP testing and SNP predictions are very, very important as well. So those are the kind of markers that we use to group people together. However, there is a spanner in the works. There is a fly in the ointment. Because when you're dealing with just STR markers, and that's the standard test that we all do when we first start off, there's a problem with something called convergence. And the best way of visualizing this is that two branches of the, the tree of mankind evolved independently. And they've got a common ancestor back here 2,000 years ago, but just by chance, some of the members of one approximate all the values of the other branch of, of that particular tree. And it means that it looks like two distantly related uh, individuals are much more closely related than they actually are. And it means that you'll start contact with this person saying, oh, it looks like we've got a, an ancestor 100 years ago, when in actual fact it's 1,000 or 2,000 years back. And that, the only way that you can get around that is by doing SNP testing. So, to summarize grouping then, the markers of potential relatedness help us group people together who are likely to be related within the last 1,000 years or so. The decision to group depends on the totality of the evidence. And if any of you want to become Surname Project Administrators, it is your accumulating experience as an administrator that will help you in this regard. So convergence is a major problem in some groups, but not in others. So for example, does anybody here have the marker of Nile of the Nine Hostages? M222, Jim, yes, we have a few people. Convergence is going to be a real problem in your particular group. Is anybody here L226, the marker of O'Brien? Okay, so you're going to have a lot of problems in your particular groups as well. And really the only way that you can sort them out, the wheat from the chaff, is to do SNP testing and see if the SNP places you on one branch or the other. So once grouped, you can analyze your results. And I presented to the Malloy clan on their DNA results back in August in Tullamore. And here are the results of the Malloy clan. Um, we have very, various groups. Group 1 is from Ireland. Group 2 is from Ireland. Group 3 is from Ireland. Group 4 is probably awfully, probably. Group 5 is Scots-Irish. And Group 6 is Ireland. The interesting thing, three groups. Group number 3, group number 4, and group number 6 are all M222. And it turned out later that a lot of people in group four should not be there at all. Their SNP testing showed that they should be completely out of that group. And further SNP testing in group number six, who on the basis of STR markers were very distantly related, or were not related to group four at all, they turned out to be related to group four because they had the same SNP marker. So convergence can be a really big problem. Um, there's another thing here. Now these are not all the boys. There's a Dempsey. Dempsey, Callahan, uh, McGovern, I think, you know, McSforum, Purcell, and Macmillan. So why are there different surnames in this group? And it could be because you're looking at people who are um, adopt you know, there was an adoption along their lines, 
or they might be pre-surname relatives, people that they're related to more than a thousand years ago, highly unlikely. Convergence is a major problem for most of those people who have a different surname to the rest of the group. So, what kind of questions could you ask about these groups? You could ask how old is the group, where is the group from, is there any evidence of a surname or DNA switch, any evidence of chance matches, where do they sit on the tree of mankind, and what is the branching structure within the group? So let's look at one of these groups, group number five, and see what we can tell. So here's group number five. There's about seven members in that group. These are their DNA results. You can see that there are some mutations there. There's a mutation. There's some mutations there. There are some mutations there. But apart from that, they actually look like they're fairly close matches to each other. So why are you getting Max Baron, Malloy, Purcell, Max Baron, Malloy, Purcell, Macmillan, Malloy? I mean, there's some Malloys there, but the majority of that group aren't Malloys at all. So where are they from? Well, if you look at their uh, country of origin, Northern Ireland, Scotland, Northern Ireland, Scotland, Scotland. So they're probably Scots-Irish, just based on what they've self-reported. How long have they carried the name? Well, the oldest um, pedigree here goes back to 1680, but nobody in this group shares a common ancestor that they triangulate on. There's no two people that share the same common ancestor, so 1680, it doesn't really mean anything. If you do look the tip report on the two most distantly related people, you get uh, an estimate, a midpoint estimate again, <coughs> that they're related about 12 generations ago, which translates into about 1600, plus or minus 150 years. <coughs> Any evidence of a surname or DNA switch? Well, actually, you've got Macmillan, Purcell, Mac Max Farm. They're not all Malloys. There are different surnames there. Some kind of a switch has happened. Where do they sit on the tree of mankind? Well, a lot of them have tested their terminal SNP, and it's BY21596 for four of these members. So that helps you place them on the tree of mankind, specifically on this part of the tree here. So here they are. This is our group five. This is where they sit on the big tree, which is one of the uh, haplotrees trees that you can use, and that's the, the various SNPs, the various branches all the way down to their present one, BY12596. I also use the haplogroup projects, and I encourage all the members to join the haplogroup projects to see if we can get further surnames which may actually have this particular association. And on that basis, we got McSparron, Purcell, Purcell, Macmillan, and Malloy. So nothing more than what we already knew, but it's always useful looking at the haplogroup projects try and trawl more close matches. Then when we started looking at surname distribution maps, the Purcells were kind of Southern Irish, and the Macmillans were kind of Northern Irish, tantalizingly close to Scotland. Now this was using John Grenham's excellent surname distribution maps, but a great one for comparing Ireland and Britain is forebears.co.uk. And when you look at forebears, this is the Purcell distribution, this is the Macmillan distribution, and look at that Scots-Irish association there. Um, this is the Max Sporum, and again, almost exclusively Scots-Irish. This is the Max Sparum, again, Scots-Irish. This is the Max Sporan, again, largely in Scotland. And when we look at Malloy, it's kind of ubiquitous in Ireland and spread throughout uh, England and Scotland. We changed Malloy to Melloy, now we're beginning to get a Scots-Irish distribution. And if we change it from Melloy to Milloy, again, we're getting a very, very strong Scottish distribution. So on the basis of that, we can conclude that there is a strong suggestion of a Scots-Irish uh, connection. And if you go into the pedigrees there and ask people, well, what is the history of your particular genealogy? where we end up with the sporum, and we start looking at the sporum, which of course is the Scottish version of the purse. And some of the families actually have documented evidence that their Max Sporums 
they have some children that were born McSparren, and then the later children of the family were born as Purcells. So Purcell is actually an anglicization of McSparren. And the McSparrens and the Purcells spring from the same genetic source. Macmillan is a very interesting one. This chap is African American. He lives in North Carolina. And the, um, uh, probably what happened was the slave owner, or the plantation owner, actually passed, or somebody on that plantation, passed that surname down to this particular um, individual's uh, slave ancestors, and it came down to this particular individual today. So that's, a, 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 that is another type of surname DNA switch. Now obviously, the, um, the Y DNA of this particular individual goes back to a European man, so this could very well be an example of the sexual exploitation of black women by white men in America during the period of slavery. Where the Malloy comes in is still open to question. We don't actually know. Is it a, a surname distribution switch? Is, is there an adoption there and an illegitimacy? It's certainly coming from the same Scots-Irish area, but we don't um, actually know why the Malloy is sitting there with the McSparrows. So those are the kind of questions that you could ask. Um, how old is the group? You can look at pedigrees, the tip tool. You can use dating using SIMS as well, which is very, very good for the um, upper uh, parts of the human evolutionary tree. The SAP program is a new automated tool that people will be using, um, that will be talked about during the course of the weekend by Dave Vance, who invented the tool, who's doing a presentation. Um, where is the group from? The birth location of the most distant known ancestor is essential for this type of analysis. Absolutely essential. Uh, old world pedigrees, absolutely essential. You can also look at nearest neighbor analysis and see who you match, and then use those surname distribution maps to see where they might have come from. But the totality of the evidence will point you in a particular direction. You're never going to be 100% sure unless you dig up an ancestor from that location and test him yourself. Is there any evidence of a surname or DNA switch? If there is, then you're left with the question, well, which came first? The Max Foran chicken or the Malloy egg? We don't actually know, and it's very, very difficult to know until you do a lot more testing of people and seeing which surname looks the youngest. That's probably the, the surname or DNA switch. And lastly, where do they sit on the Oh, Is there any evidence of, of chance matches? If there is, if there is convergence, then the big Y is the only way that you can really go to sort that problem out. So I'm going to end there. That is a brief uh, analysis of what your Y DNA results mean. I think we have time for one or two questions, so thanks very much for your attention. Now, could I ask Jared to uh, take the microphone and go around the room if there are any specific questions? Anybody got any questions? We have time for one or two. There's a lady over here, a gentleman over here. Uh, I have a brief uh, comment to make. Uh, on the, the list of uh, items you gave in relation to uh, explaining the discrepancies between DNA and the, and the uh, surname, there's one major item which I think is generally neglected, and that is, and that, is that we tend to look back an inch and down into the lens, to Christian lens, and through the structure of marriage as we know it today. If you go back to ancient down to about the 14th century, um, there were clearly groups that had privileged access to multiple partners for the propagation of many, many warriors. Because the chiefs of warriors depended on having strong military structures. They understood that warriors beget warriors. And so the chiefs had privileged access, and their, their, their progeny, the warriors, had privileged access. And so in that way, you actually have, had, had, had a propagation of particular genetic markers. And that's a major cause, I think, of, of the, the discrepancies that you find today. Right up to the, that's beyond the 14th century. Sure, no, absolutely. Just to, in case you didn't hear that, uh, there's, a, uh, there's a question over here as well, Jared. Um, uh, warriors had access to large groups of women that they could procreate with. And that's how the, the Y DNA of a particular man might have been propagated uh, because warriors read warriors. 
And examples of that might be Genghis Khan and the fact that his uh, DNA uh, was spread so widely in Mongolia and of course our own Nile of the Nine hostages, his, him, either himself and his clan, a lot of them would have uh, propagated to uh, make the clan strong. Another question? Good question. Two people who know no known relationship with the same surname marry. How will that DNA reflect in the children? Well, uh, from the Y DNA point of view, it's only going to be coming down from the man. But if uh, two people get married, they have the same surname. If they are related to each other, then you're going to have perhaps a double connection. So, for example, whereas we might have eight great grandparents and 16 great great and 32, they might only have 28 great 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 grandparents instead of 32. So you will get that double connection, and it means that there will be more DNA coming down from a particular uh, in that particular family, and uh, it, it causes problems when you start matching with people on both sides. It wouldn't show up in the actual DNA the relationship. It wouldn't in the FTD and family tree DNA. The children. Um, it it can do, and if you look go to get match and push the uh, the um, your DNA up on get match, you can do what's called a runs of homozygosity, and that can actually tell you whether there's a likelihood that your parents were related to each other. Great, we have to call it a day there, I'm afraid, because we have the next speaker coming in. Um, so thank you very very much for your kind attention, and I'll answer your question uh, personally. Thank you.